Well, it's 2023. We're already in the month of March. We're halfway through it. And listen, we've been talking about our promised land. We've been talking about going into your promised land. It's no coincidence. It's time. We started off the, the series talking about it is time. It's time for a change. Many of you have expressed that in your lives. You've said, it's time. I'm not living that way any longer. It is time for things to change. And so the Lord is taking us into our promised land. They might have been that way a long time, but it's time for us to move into the destiny that God has for us in Jesus' name. Last week, if you were here, you remember we talked about last week, Joshua meeting Joshua. In other words, the pre-incarnate Jesus, when he was in the Old Testament, before he was born to the Virgin Mary, uh, Jesus became a man Jesus. He was listed in the Old Testament quite a bit. And what he was listed as oftentimes was the angel, capital A, the angel of the Lord, Yahweh, and another Yahweh, meaning God, the tripart, the son of the Trinity. And we talked about that last week. And we left off where in that moment, there was holy ground. And, you know, I was walking around passing out the soil, David, our farmer, corrected me. It's not dirt. <laughs> dirt is dirt. But ground is soil, and soil is alive. And that's why it's so important. So um, anyway, I love that kind of correction because <laughs> he's right. It, soil is alive. And when you and I have a holy moment with God, it becomes an inspiration and things change. The ground changed, the soil changed. And in that moment, you can go back and listen to it if you didn't hear that message, but it's important. So we had a holy moment. God has been showing up here to Joy Church in these services. I mean, you sense in the praise and worship, you sense God here. We've been hearing testimonies of great things. The baptism two weeks ago that we had, all of the spontaneous baptisms that happen. And the life change that is happening, it's so exciting to be a part of what God is doing, to be involved in it. You know, it's no accident that you're alive right now. The scripture actually says that God picked us and predestined when we specifically would be born and the generation that we would live in. And the reason for that is because God has an assignment for you. You're not an accident. You're not an afterthought. You are here for a purpose and here for a reason, and God's got a plan, and our role is to jump in and say, yes, I'm available. My hands are raised. I surrender to you. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll say whatever you want me to say. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I humble myself before you. And so in that holy moment last week, we talked about how it's in those holy ground moments that God gives us strategy do this, do this. This is how you're going to do it. Today, we're going to get into the strategy a little bit more, and we're going to talk specifically about how to encompass and encircle, circle around your obstacles or the problems that you have in life. Hey, here's what I can guarantee you. For every promise and the promised land, that God has available to you and is for you, there will be an obstacle. There will be a problem. And we should admit it, identify it. But today, what we're going to do from God's word is we're going to learn a strategy of how to encircle our problems. So we're going to get into God's word here, and you're going to be able to follow along and figure out the battle strategy. And by the way, the battle strategies that God uses, when God brings a battle strategy, he loves to get glory out of the strategy. So it will typically be something that is outside of normal common sense, because God will have us do things that 
people from the outside will look at and go, well, that on the, on the front side of it, they'll say, that doesn't make sense. That's stupid. That, and, and what you and I have to have the ability to do is know that we had a holy moment and that it was God that gave the strategy, not mankind. And then this takes real maturity. This is part of growing up and becoming a disciple of Christ is to follow even in the midst of the questions that are all around because, you know, people will often look at the strategy that the Lord gives and they'll question it like, pastor has lost his mind or enjoy church has lost their mind. Why? Because God gives strategies that when it's all done on the backside, everybody that notices and everybody that looks will have to say that was God. That was God. That changed life was God. That was a God moment. That was a God time. That was a God life. So let's get into the word today and see what the word says. We're going to go back to Joshua. We left off in Joshua last week, chapter six. We left off here at verse 12. Joshua got up early the next morning. The priest took the ark of the Lord, verse 13. And the seven priests carried the seven ram's horns, marched in front of them, uh, in front of the ark of the Lord, while the ram's horns were blowing. The armed men went in front of them, and the rear guard went behind the ark of the Lord. Verse 14, and on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. Verse 15, Early on the seventh day, they started down and marched around the city seven times in the same way. That was the only day they marched around the city seven times. I want to encourage you. Here's some strategies. I'm going to give you a few nuggets here, and we'll get real specific on three different strategies. But I want to encourage you. When the Lord gives a strategy, follow it. I need to say that again. When the Lord gives a strategy, follow it. And thank the Lord we have his word. His word is alive. His word is powerful. We have 66 books of his word, and it is alive, and it is powerful. The word of God will change your life. Verse 16, after the seventh time, the priest blew the ram's horn, and Joshua said to the troops, shout, shout. For the Lord has given you the city. He said to the troops, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Here's some principles. Here's some principles. Verse 17, but he went on and said, but the city and everything in it is set apart for the Lord's destruction. Only Rahab, the prostitute. Isn't it funny that he still called her the prostitute? Only Rahab the prostitute and everyone within her house will live because she hid the messengers. Let me, have, let me just share some good news with you. If you think you're hopeless or you think you've got too bad of a past, I have good news for you today. Your past is not too big. It's not too bad. God uses hurting people. God uses broken people. God uses messed up people. Rahab the prostitute of all the people in the city had a soft heart towards God and his people. She was a heathen. She had a heathen business. She had a heathen job. And yet she was open because she had, this is why Easter is so important. She had heard about how good God was to the Israelite people and to the Jewish people. This is why you need to share your testimony because someone down the road, some crazy someone is gonna hear about how God has been good to you and you will influence them. And don't ever disqualify anybody. Don't ever disqualify them because God can use the least of us. And wants to use, he gets more glory when he takes broken people, messed up people, and he uses them. And so we just go along for the ride and say, I'm not all that. Never try to take credit for who you are. It's God that made you who you are. 
When you've submitted your life to him and you allow him to use you, let me just share that with you. God wants to use you. You are special to the Lord. And Rahab and her family, because they were soft to the gospel of Jesus, good things happened in their life. So stay soft toward the Lord. Amen. Make sure that your heart is tender toward the Lord. You know, there's another principle here with Rahab. She stayed connected to the right people. I always told my kids, I still tell them that. I I teach this. I've lived this principle. Any time in my life I've ever gotten in trouble, it's because I've been with the wrong people. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. You could see that. We used, my, my, one of my kids, I could always tell when they had been with the particular kid. I could always, I could always tell. Because this principle, who you connect with, protect who you connect with, protect who you hang around. I love everybody and I'm open to love everybody and invite everybody. But if you want to be in my inner circle, you have to have a few things. One is you have to be a person of faith. It means you can't live in fear because fear is very contagious. I don't need any very, 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 very close friends that operate in fear because so much of what I do, pastoring requires, almost everything I do, pastoring requires extreme faith. And if I've got a negative, fearful voice always putting a fear inside of me, fear, fear, fear. How many of you know, I got to get away from that. So faith is one thing. But the other thing is I need to be around positive people who are not negative. There's so much negative in the world. And I could struggle with that myself. So I've got to protect myself from that negativity. So I love people that are positive and that are negative. I love them both equally. But for me and my personal time of fellowship, you only have 24 hours in a day. You need to connect with people and stay connected. You love everybody and you give a little moment to a lot of different people of a lot of different backgrounds. But who you open your heart up to and you break bread with and fellowship with, they need to be positive people negativity will steal your joy. Negativity will steal your faith. Negativity will get your head going down the wrong pathway. So I just encourage you, uh, be around positive people. Stay connected to the right people. And the best way to do that is to be the right people. Be what you want to attract. Mm Mm-hmm. Joshua 6.20. So the troops shouted, and the ram's horns sounded. And when they heard the blast of the ram's horns, the troops gave a great shout. It said the word great, a great shout. And the walls collapsed, and the troops advanced into the city, each man straight ahead, and they captured the city. So I want to talk to you about how to encircle in a real practical way. I'm going to give you the spiritual part and the practical part of how to, when you're going into your promised land, let's use this as an example. When you go into your promised land, there will always, guaranteed, 100% of the time, be obstacles and problems in your way. It's part of the course. It's the way things happen. When you have a place you're going into, a new place, an advancement, new territory, there are always obstacles in the way. It's just the way that it is. We wish oftentimes there wasn't something in the way. We wish that it could just be the gravy train all the time, but that's not reality. There are obstacles in the way. So the key is that we learn a few principles from God's word as we study how to obtain our promised land and walk into our promised land. There's obstacles in the land. The first obstacle that they had was Jericho. And if you'll notice, we learn, and I've said this several times throughout the series, we learn more of what not to do 
than what to do. There are a lot of things you learn from other people. I've, I've learned more in my life from my mistakes. They're not bad. My mistakes aren't bad because they taught me so much. And if you'll, instead of being afraid of mistakes, learn from them and use them and milk everything from them. That was a mistake. I won't ever do that again, or I'll try not to. If you'll learn those type of things, you'll grow. And if you can learn a higher form of wisdom is learning and watching other people and going, ooh, I won't do that. As you watch other people learn, ooh, that's not the way to go on that. You can learn that, right? And so what we see them learning in this situation was 40 years ago when the Lord had done miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle and they, he parted the Red Sea and they crossed over the Red Sea and then what did they do? They did what we often are tempted to do. They talked. And, and it, the temptation is to express fear, express negativity, because we're often looking at the obstacle. And let me, let me explain to you what they did that you and I have got to learn. If we're going to enter our promised land, And if we are going to move into the things that God has for us, we have to learn some of these things. Joshua told them, we're going to march around. This was the instruction of the Lord. The Lord helped this wisdom, and the Lord is helping us with our wisdom on how to face our obstacles that we're facing in our life today. Here's part of the wisdom of that, that Jesus gave us. Joshua, you're going to walk around the city for seven days, once a day for the first six days. On the seventh day, you're going to walk around seven times. And Joshua told the people, when you walk around, this is wisdom, don't say a word. In other words, in modern day vernacular, he would say, when you walk around, shut up. Because here's why, I know why. I know why. If you don't make yourself shut up. You will say what you think. And many times over the last 20 years in my life personally, the one thing I have worked on harder and more often than anything is learning to shut my mouth. This convicts some people. I had one guy, uh, uh, Seven or eight months ago, get up and walk out of the service. Told his family later. I, he was preaching right at me. He preached the whole sermon right at me. And funny thing was, I didn't know him. But, you know, the Holy Spirit will do that because he loves us so much. Sometimes we need a little spanking once in a while. And the Holy Spirit will say, you need to shut up your mouth, kid. I'm going to have the preacher preach a message. And I didn't even know. He came back. A few weeks later, and I preached on being positive again, and he walked out knowing that I was being informed by his family. I'm just saying the Holy Spirit will correct us. It's not me. I'm not mad at you. I'm not upset with you. But I do know this, that with me personally, the Lord worked on me to say, you've got to quit saying it just because you thought it. Because here's what happens. We all have the obstacles and we all have the problems. This is practical 101 of how to enter into your promised land and face the obstacles and face the problems. We have to circle around them with a quiet mouth. Because if I am circling my problem and I'm looking at it, I'm going, that wall's too big. That wall's made of big stones. I, I don't even see in the natural how we circling around this thing and being quiet. What does this do? This doesn't do jack. I don't, see, my thoughts may be telling me that, but the d- spiritual discipline of watching what words come out of my mouth, and if I can't say good words, I need to just be quiet. Because because here's the principle. I've observed this ever since I've heard it taught. I've taught it. I've lived it. You will get what you say. I'm going to die in the wilderness. Yep, you're right. 
You can't, I can't build a business like that. They can. Yep, you can't. It's not until you learn to hush your mouth to the right time, circle in your problem. Oh, I'm wanting to talk, but these crazy thoughts are going through my head, but I'm not going to say them. So what do I do? How do I do it? Let's get to the practical part of it. Number one, the first thing you need to do, and this will help you shut your mouth and not say the negative stuff, is circle your problems with prayer. I love our prayer ministry. I love what happens here with our prayer workers, with those that pray. We just had our prayer meeting at the end of the service last week. We have a prayer meeting every Wednesday. Louise leads that. It's here at the church at noon on Wednesdays. You're welcome to come and pray. At the end of every service, we have prayer workers and prayer ministers that will pray with you. Prayer is simply us approaching God and having a conversation with God. It is a time where you can talk about all that you want to talk about with God and call on God. There's a supernatural process that happens when you talk to God. Most people confuse and complicate prayer to be something that it's not. It's a time where you communicate with God. I love the Lord's Prayer. A lot of times religion has made the Lord's Prayer a prayer, and there's nothing wrong with praying it as a prayer. It gives It's good to memorize the Scripture. But really what the Lord's Prayer is, is it is an outline of how to pray. When the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, he did what we often do in our sermons, and that is we give an outline. Okay, here's what I would do. Number one, approach the Father this way. Our Father, which art in heaven, You're in heaven. You made all this. It's all yours. It gives you perspective. You're big. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You're holy, God. And he gives this outline. I won't preach the whole thing to you right now, but you can read that. Go through. It's an outline of how to begin to pray and talk to God. Brag on God. Talk about his greatness. Talk about his holiness. And then go through that outline, and you'll begin to have a successful prayer life. But The way we need to overcome these obstacles is a time of prayer. Circle these things, pray. Pray about things you understand. Pray about things you don't understand. Come before the Lord. Matthew chapter six, verse six says this. When you pray, not if you pray, we're all supposed to be praying, go into your private room, shut the door, and pray to your father who is in secret. Your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. The Lord will reward you because you've spent time with him. One of the great places I love to pray is in my car. I love driving down the road, talking to the Lord. And I will talk to him about everything. I'll talk to him about things I see that I like. Lord, I really like that billboard. Lord, I love that building. That house is a cool house. You know, and just talk to him about things that you think about, things that you perceive, things that you're beginning to get a revelation on, things you don't understand. Bring those before the Lord in your prayer time and talk to God about everything. Lord, I'm a little concerned about this. I give it to you because I'm refusing to walk in fear, but I am concerned about it, so I give it to you. I release it to you. I let this go in your presence, and I trust you with it so you can talk to the Lord about those things. Let me bring a little more depth of understanding to some of the confusion because I've heard people pray this way, Lord, if it be thy will. Let me tell you, it's okay to pray if it be thy will when the word doesn't address it. But when when you've got the word of God, this is why it's important for us to study the word of God, be involved in small groups, study the word of God. Because for example, when it comes to his will to save someone, you better just know this, the Lord wants him saved. How cruel would it be if he created some people to go to hell? How cruel would that be? See, there's an actual belief system out there, religious belief system that everybody is predestined either for heaven or predestined for hell. And everybody's predestined for heaven, but you were given a free choice. 
So you can go to hell if you want to go to hell by rejecting what was paid for. It's paid for, baby. You can accept what's been paid for and you can go to heaven. Nobody, nobody was predestined for eternal damnation. In fact, the scripture says it is his will. What was his will? Predestination. It is his will that all would be saved, that none perish. That's the will of God. That's the word of God. So you don't have to even pray the prayer if it be your will to save them. How cruel would that be that God say, no, it wasn't my will. No, it is. So anything, this is just good for your theology and for your personal doctrine so you know how to pray, so you know how to stand in faith. You know how to stand on the word of God, standing in faith that God has a covenant. Isaiah chapter 53, you have so many covenants. You have the Abrahamic covenant. You have the Mosaic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, Mosaic covenant. You have the Davidic, that's David's covenant. And then you have the covenant of Jesus that was prophesied about in Isaiah chapter 53. And here's what I want you to know. You don't ever have to pray if it be thy will for anything that was promised through the covenant. That ought to get you excited because if you understand that it's been paid for, the word of God is the will of God. The will of God is the word of God. The will of God is the word of God. The word of God is the will of God. What is the will of God? The word of God. How do I know the word of God? Studying the word of God. Hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing again and again the word of God. So when I know the word of God, I know the will of God. So if a doctor's report says something crazy about me, I can approach the word and stand in faith on that word, confess the word, declare the word, circle the report, circle the problem, circle it with prayer, circle it with confession. Lord, I stand on your word. Lord, I believe your word above this, above that. And so I circled those things with prayer. Maybe start keeping a prayer journal. My wife keeps great prayer journals and they're awesome because she can look back and oftentimes in a prayer journal, she'll be praying about a specific thing and she'll get a word from the Lord about a situation and you ought to be praying about that. So, you know, the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah prayed and wrote his journal there were short prayers and there were long prayers. You ought to have some short prayers and you ought to have some longer prayers too. And then where you don't know the will of God, you can pray, Lord, let your will be done because I don't know. You know, we, we, we have some car salesmen in our church and it depends on who you ask the will of God for. I was teasing David Wooden, he sells Chevrolets. And if you ask him, I'm, I'm trying to decide whether I buy a Chevrolet or whether I buy a Nissan, he's going to have a word of the Lord for you. <laughs> the word of the Lord says, thus buy a Chevrolet. Our, <laughs> our, our pastor, Matt Gonzalez, he sells Nissans. And if you ask him, I'm praying about which car to buy, he's going to have a word of the Lord for you to buy this Nissan. Here's the point. Here's the point. There are some things, whether you date this person or date that person or whether you buy this house or that house, some things you don't have a specific scripture for, you, can, you need the leading of the Holy Spirit on what's best in a particular situation. So your prayer life can be that way. Let me read some verses about prayer that will give you some faith and confidence. Romans chapter eight, I love it because Romans chapter seven talks about our flesh and how the fleshly man wants what it wants, when it wants it, and when does it want it, it wants it now. No patience, you know, my flesh, I can't trust it. But when I come over to chapter eight, it talks about how to be led by the Spirit. I love being led by the Spirit specifically on things that the Word doesn't directly address. It has to do oftentimes with timing, with maybe the things that, you know, like buying a car or a house or a dating relationship. Most of the time, you can figure out the dating relationship from the Word. Don't date 
an unbeliever. Oh no, I like them. I will bring them to church and introduce them to Jesus. That's called dating evangelism. (laughs) And it doesn't work, number one. Number two, it will create all kinds of hell and heartache for you down the road because of being unequally yoked. So it's just good advice. Good advice. Sometimes we don't like the advice of the word. And so we bend things to kind of fit. We contort our soul to fit what conform to what we want. Don't do that. <laughs> Romans 8, 26, in the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness because we don't know what to pray for some things. For we pray as we should, but the Spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit himself, intercedes with us, for us, with inexpressible groanings. That specifically is talking about your prayer language. This is why I am not ashamed, I'm not shy, like people... People are going to think you're weird talking about your prayer language and praying in tongues. No, no, you need to hear it. You need to be taught about it. Don't be afraid of it. If they don't find out now, they'll find out someday, maybe in heaven. But praying in your spirit language is never something to be ashamed of or you've got to hide it. Now, in public meetings, the gift of public tongues is different than personal prayer. But when you, in your car and at home, you have an opportunity to use your prayer language to allow the Holy Spirit through your prayer language to intercede on your behalf concerning things you don't know how to pray for. And you lift them up through praying in the Spirit. It's perfect language. It's God's language. It, here's what I love about it so much. It requires 100% faith because your head doesn't get confused and you don't mix understanding with it. You don't understand it. You won't ever understand it. You can't understand it. You can perceive through your spirit understanding, though, And what I often do, my wife and I do this when we're praying, like, you know, we'll be praying for our children about a specific thing or lifting up a need in the church or even over our nation or our community. And we'll say, Lord, we don't really know exactly how to pray for this. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray in the spirit right now. We're going to lift this situation up to you in the spirit. And by your Holy Spirit, you know exactly what to declare. You know exactly what to pray and how to pray And so we'll lift it up. And we'll pray in the spirit. And as we do that, we're by faith releasing the trouble of that situation, the pain or the worry or the fear of it. We'll lift that up before God. I'm I'm telling you, this will help you be free. So why did I say all that? If you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit because that gives you the ability to then use your prayer language. And who's it for? It's available to every believer, number one. Number two, people have the misconception. This is nowhere in the Bible. Well, there's only, I only got one word. I can only use one word in tongues. Well, that ain't in the Bible. You have a fluent prayer language. And the reason I know you do is because it requires 100% faith to say one word or 400 words. It's the same faith. You have a fluent prayer language. Church, I encourage you, everybody online, I encourage you, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Even if you don't understand this, it's biblical, it's in the Bible, do some study on it. And if you don't, Go to our prayer ministers and have them lay hands on you and pray for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You will be filled with the Holy Spirit and you will have the ability to pray in the Spirit. Verse 27, and he, that's the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who searches our hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Oh, there's some things I don't know how to pray. I better pray in the Spirit with groanings. 
He knows the will of God. He knows how to pray. Verse 28, here's the famous verse. For we know that all things work together for good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So the qualifiers is to make sure that I'm in a place where I'm loving God with all of my heart and to make sure that, see, he's called all of us, but make sure I'm responding to the call of his purpose that I don't have my own agenda. I have a tendency to want my own agenda like you do, but to constantly yield. And he knows how to pray. And this should bring you a little bit of peace because Luke chapter 18, Jesus was teaching. And in verse one, he said this. He said, you should pray always and never stop. There are some things, one of the reasons I love being around baby Christians is because baby Christians seems like they always get their prayers answered right away, don't they? I mean, if I love, that's why we need to always be bringing in new babies because man, you need to rub off around them. Hey, will you pray for me? Have those babies pray for you because when a baby cries, they get their diapers changed. When a baby cries, they get fed a bottle. And if we, if, we get, if we get old in here and we don't have any new babies around here, you got to be a lot more patient. You think you have to be patient with babies. Babies get results. And what I want to say to you is this. There's something about that because in Luke 18, verse 1, Jesus said, listen, pray always. I'm paraphrasing, but pray with endurance. Never quit, never cease, never stop praying about things. See, because my tendency, because I'm human like you are, my tendency is to look at that problem and say, Eric, I've been praying for this thing for 20 years and I haven't really seen breakthrough yet. My temptation, my natural temptation is to just back off of it and just say, well, I guess it's not the will of God because it's been 20 years. 20 years seems like a long time to me. And I've been praying for it and I haven't seen any breakthrough. I haven't seen anything happen. Hey, everybody, welcome to the club. What club is that? The club called Jesus is at work. See, if we believe this verse we just read, here's what this means. It means that it may have been 20 years, but God is at work still. I never quit because I don't know when the breakthrough, but God works all things together for good. So here's the point. Here's the point. Sometimes God answers almost immediately, but other times he's maximizing circumstances that take time. Let me say that again because This will bring peace to you. If he works all things together for good, though it's taken 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and you've been praying about it, he is the master chess player. And he is working together and he's maximizing circumstances. So be patient with him because he may need this in place to be able to do this in a great way and he is maximizing the circumstances so you keep your job is to keep praying I need to move on real quick and give you the last two real quick but keep your eyes on Jesus here's the next one and that is your enthusiasm may wane but never let your perseverance wane. In other words, circle your problem with perseverance. If you could get anything today, this is a huge one. Perseverance, I will not quit. I will not quit. You, where will you find me? I make this statement oftentimes. People ask me, are you gonna retire? Or you know, you're in your 60s and stuff. I have no plan for retirement. Uh, I might do a few different things, but I'm not ever going to go sit on a couch and just hang out. 
I'm gonna work. I will persevere. You will find me, I declare this over my life, you will find me in 20 years, in 40 years, if Jesus hasn't come back yet, I'm gonna be preaching, I'm gonna be building the church, building the kingdom of God, and you just need to make your mind up. I'm gonna be praying, I'm gonna be studying the word of God, confessing the word of God, I'm gonna be connecting people to Jesus, I'm gonna be helping people, I'm gonna be raising up young people, and you circle your problems with perseverance. I love, I honestly, I love enthusiasm more than perseverance. I just love being enthusiastic. I love being, I love caffeine. I, 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 lo, I love energy. I love enthusiasm. I love inspiration. I love motivation. I love all of those things because they release those endorphins that, you know, enthusiasm, my man, I'm excited. I want to enjoy another day. But what I've noticed, and I've really seen it, Pastor Eric, some of you I've told about this, but Pastor Eric broke all, he hooked me up and between him and, and Dr. Neil and some of those that are close around me, this is why it's so important to have the right people around you. Uh, this past January, so we're January, February, we're halfway through March. It's been almost three months. I started working out physically again. After what I went through two years ago, I started working out physically again. And I told Pastor Steve, the guy that works with me on my training, he, special, <laughs> he specializes in training for older people. So I love it because uh, I'm not old yet, but he's helping me. And what we do is we do two workouts a week that are compressed workouts where the full body gets a workout in 15 or 20 minutes. And it, it literally, it's only been three months, but it's changing me. I can feel my energy getting stronger. My, I'm gaining weight, uh, and not fat weight as much, a little bit maybe, but did you notice I reached for that? Yeah, a little bit. But anyway, what's happening in my life now though is, and I told Steve this last week, I've noticed most of the time, especially if I've done my protein drink that he's put me on, and especially if I do my pre-workout, I told you I love energy and caffeine. He's got this pre-workout drink I'll do a little bit of, and I'll have the enthusiasm to go work out. But a lot of times, especially like last week, walking around the auditorium, giving out dirt, the devil just beat me up last week. You are so stupid. Nobody does that. I've never seen that modeled, so I don't even know if, if you can do that in church, but we did it. And I walked around and gave dirt, and the enemy was lying to me and beat me up, saying, you made it full of yourself. It drained the life out of me, but I kept by faith declaring, nope, that was a moment of God. We did that by faith. There wasn't magic in the dirt. It's a point of faith. We did it. And I had to do spiritual warfare, but let me give you the other side of it. On Monday morning, when it was time for me to go do my workout, I was zapped. And I told, I told Steve, Pastor Steve, my workout guy, I said, I, if I hadn't been on your schedule, I wouldn't have showed up if it was just me. But because I'm accountable, to you and because you're charging me money, it's not free, he charged me money. I didn't want him to lose his money because I, I would have paid the money and stayed home, but I didn't want, you know, because I'm paying him money, I wanted him to get his money. And so I showed up, but I told him, he, this is the first time in three months he's ever made this comment to me. We get almost to the end of the workout and he says, you're not as strong as you usually are. I said, it's funny you can notice that. I didn't sleep very well last night. And he said, yeah, it shows up. You're just, you don't have the, mm. And as I was preparing for this message about our problems, the Lord reminded me of this. As you're going around, it's not the enthusiasm that's most important, which 
my personality, I'd rather have the enthusiasm than the perseverance. But the Lord convicted me and said, son, the perseverance is way more important than you being enthused because enthusiasm will come and it'll go and it'll come and it'll go. But you have to persevere. James says it this way in verse one, uh, in, in chapter one, verse two, consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, when you experience various trials because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature, complete, and lack nothing. Another verse, another verse talks about that endurance develops character and character is way more important than anything else. Amen. And so let that endurance develop in you, develop it. Last thing I want to say, and I'm glad the band is up here with me for this one. Number three, surround your problems with praise and with worship. In other words, one way I can get my enthusiasm back and one way those walls can come tumbling down is when the praises go up, the blessings come down. And it is time, church, for us to start circling around our problems. We've prayed about them. We're patient. We're enduring. But when we come around those things, and I kept my mouth shut, but on the seventh day I approached, and seven times I went around. And as I went around, around and around and around, I began to praise the Lord. Songs, hymns, spiritual songs, and shouts, the trumpet blows, the band strikes it up, the cymbals, the guitar, the keyboards, the vocalists, they sing and they declare and I follow and I, I shout because, hey, here's the truth. My problems, my problems are shouting at me. I'm going to be louder than my problem. I'm going to be louder than my problem. I'm going to declare I've got the victory. Jesus is my king. Oh, we've got it. Hallelujah. My hallelujah is going to be louder. I'm going to shout. And the walls of these problems in Jesus' name are coming down. In the name of Jesus, they're coming down. I'm shouting it today. I'm singing it today. I'm declaring my victory as I do that. So if my mouth is going to say anything, it's going to be in songs, hymns, spiritual songs. You know, we are going to do that. We're going to witness the breakthrough with each other. And I, I have to be honest with you, it gets me so excited to see your breakthrough. I like my own personal breakthrough. But honestly, I like it when the church that I pastor, when you guys are experiencing breakthrough, you got a new job, a new house, you got a, your marriage got better, you got this blessing, that blessing. That's when I am so excited because I love you. And however much I love you, your Lord and Savior Jesus loves you 10 million infinitely beyond whatever I could. And I know how, I, how excited I am for you, but how much more is he for you? And he loves you. And he long, he longs for you to long for his word, to be hungry for his word. He longs for you to learn the discipline of going, okay, I'm not going to be a complainer. I'm going to trust you, Lord. And, and, and I'm learning to endure, even when I don't feel like it, I'm going to go get my spiritual workout in. And I'm going to blow the horn and I'm going to shout loud with songs of praise and worship. So, hey, church, listen, I know we live in a culture and in a time today where the old, the old thoughts of, 
you can't be loud. Listen, the Cardinal games are loud. The Blues games are loud. Not lately, but... <laughs> but when things happen in a great way, we don't have a time. We do not have a problem celebrating. And so, the most important thing in the world is when your child turns to the Lord, when you turn to the Lord, when your neighbors turn to the Lord, and when you give your life to Jesus unreserved in your praise and in your worship, man, the blessings come down. Father, we thank you for being here today. We do, we shout victory today. Thank you for the revival that is happening in our land and specifically here at home in our church. We give you praise and we thank you, Jesus. Oh, we say thank you. And we worship you, Lord. And I declare as we shout, we're going to give a shout here in just a second. Those spiritual problems and obstacles in our lives, we declare they're coming down in the name of Jesus. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of warfare is our Lord. So on the count of three, I want you to stand up with me. Everybody stand up. We're going to shout our victory over the circumstances that we face. In Jesus' name, on three, just give the Lord a big old loud shout. One, two.